Thank you, Keith, uh, and good morning. Uh, my role here is, is pretty specific, to give you a, a, a status update of the mountain pine beetle. And I want to start basically from this time last year and work through our operational cycle of what has happened, what the beetles are doing, and our control efforts. And at the end, I want to provide some perspective on some of the long-term trends that we've seen. We've, we've been battling beetles uh, really since, since the late 90s, so we've you know, 13, 14 years into it, we're starting to see some trends. And some of these trends are particularly interesting, and maybe it's a, a highlight of what's going to happen here in the future. So this afternoon, Darren Tapp is going to talk about a little bit more about the strategic issues we're dealing with as a government. So my role here is very, very specific, talking about the focus of our operational program. In our operational program, we really look at it in three different perspectives, with three different three different steps that we go through year after year after year. And the first one is to keep in mind what our objectives or our program is. Second of all, understanding the risk of spread from the beetles themselves. And third is the actual control work that occurs in the fall. And we've, we've spoken about this since 2006 and 2007 when the province came up with their prime objectives of what we're trying to do with the Mountain Pine Middle Program. And there's, there's two key fundamental things that we're trying to achieve. Our prime objectives for this program. Uh, one, prevent that spread of beetles going north-south along the eastern slopes. This is where a lot of our big susceptible pine trees are, as well as our critical watersheds. That's key for us to keep those fairly clean. And two, our objective is to slow the spread, or originally it was to stop it, or to slow the spread from going further east in the jack pines and further across Canada. That puts into perspective all of our decisions for the entire year. It really helps us focus in on what is important and what we're trying to achieve. The more technical aspect, which is a 12-month a, a year program, is understanding what is the risks of spread of the beetles in the province. And we use a very biologically based system to, to understand that, and it evolves year after year after year. But we have to ask ourselves the question of how well do the beetles survive the winter? Uh, how many infested trees are there in each particular area across the province? Are these local beetle populations spreading year after year after year? Are we getting immigration coming in from BC or uncontrolled parts of Alberta? And how much susceptible pine is there and how connected are those pine across the province? This understanding risk starts this time of year. Um, cold weather events are, are over. We try to get an understanding of understanding what the cold weather has done to our beetle populations. And this science is, is, it's tough to get a good sample size to get a good true representation of what's going on over winter but we try to get the best information we can as an early warning for us to say this is how well the beetles are, are entering the summer this is what we anticipate across the province for that year and so this map depicts what what we were looking at at this time last year we had, the forest health officers had gone to the field they had sampled the trees they basically calculate the number of beetles that have gone into that tree and the number that are expected to come out and from that, we get a, a relative idea of is the population going to increase or decrease or remain static throughout the province. That's, that's the theory behind these R value surveys in the summer. So at this time last year, this is where our trends are. In, the areas in blue are the areas where the populations did not, they didn't survive very well in the winter. We expected very poor success. The beetles were not doing very well. We anticipated that the populations would naturally be decreasing in these areas. And you can see the good news, a lot of it in around Slave Lake, uh, in around the high elevation sites, Grand Cache, in around the Wilmore, the populations weren't doing very well this time last year. But we do have some hot spots. Um, the area north of Grand Prairie, Peace River, um, we do see some areas in red, which indicates the beetles did very, very well. We expected some good local beetle production out of those areas. You'll see this area down around in here, um, in around the White Court area, we saw and last time of this year, we saw some, some good survival. We anticipated there's probably going to be some good local production out of this area. Now, we've been doing these population forecasts for the last several years. And although you, the trends, the, we have some trends out there, we're starting to see pattern after pattern after pattern. In a general area, in general sense, you can see year after year after year from 2010, 11, and 12, we get these populations north of Grand Prairie that typically do fairly well and we typically get good beetle survival over there. We also see this patch, you know, just south of Grand Prairie, we typically see fairly good beetle survival as well. And these areas out in the fringes, over the last several years, the beetles haven't done very well, as well as in around the high elevation sites, which that one is not that unexpected. They don't do very well. But this really gives us an idea of where the hotspots are. It starts to give us a better, clear idea of what our risk is across the province. 
Our next question we need to answer is how far are these beetles moving year after year after year? Either from in flights, local beetle spread, we just don't know. So what we do is we, we do a series of, of grid baits across the province in uninfested areas to find out have the beetles moved into these novel habitats, into these new habitats, how much has their range expanded? And on this map here, the areas in blue are all the areas where we grid bait and the areas are red are the positive hits from this year. So these are the areas that were uninfested, now we're starting to see some, some beetles and we get a good early indication of where the beetles have spread and this drives our program next year where if beetles have started moving in this area, well then that's an area to start doing aerial surveys for the next year and it drives our operational program to some extent. Two things to note on this graph in the beetle movement. The first one is this patch here, um, which is 40 to 50 kilometers from the Saskatchewan border. And we will hear, well, we'll hear Rory's presentation this afternoon about what that means to Saskatchewan and the risk to Saskatchewan and the risk of beetle spread further east. Uh, the other interesting one to note is this one up at the top corner uh, of, not in Alberta, it is actually confirmed in the Northwest Territories for the first time. Um, just crossed into the Northwest Territories, which is really something that was unheard of several years ago. If you asked whether beetles could actually grow and survive and, and spread that far north, I don't think people would have really taken it seriously if you asked that question 10 years ago. However, they are there. They did survive. Uh, I, I was up there about two or three weeks ago talking to their senior government officials about what this means, what impacts it's going to have the Northwest Territories, and what their options are for growth and population growth and, and suppression. They are starting to do an action plan, a risk assessment for the Northwest Territories to understand this insect and its impacts up north. But this information allows us to get a, a, to draw general maps of the beetle distribution in Alberta. And so I'll just explain this a little bit. The area in black is an area where we think that we have beetle populations either at endemic levels, but we have beetle populations in this area in black. The line in green is where we have currently infested green attack trees that we are pretty certain we have out there, we've observed them, and the area in red is our, our limit of where the red attack, last year's beetle attack trees are. So this is our map from 2011, and now that we've got those new dispersal baits and new information, we've expanded our map to include these areas of the dispersal baits out here, and we moved it all the way up to the Northwest Territories border. So year after year, the beetles are spreading further east and farther north than we have seen. The next part of our operational program is, is extremely labor intensive and difficult to do and it's our aerial surveys. And this gives us, it tells us where the red trees that were attacked last year are. Um, we use several different tactics to find these red trees depending on what our management objectives are. Uh, Hella GPS is probably our major tactic in the areas where we're going to do level one control operations. And you'll see the track logs in here. Um, you know, we cover a lot of this area of highly susceptible pine using the helicopters and we do that over a 30-day period between middle of August to the middle of September um, and it's very labor intensive low elevation flying. In addition we also do aerial photography we've done these three patches this year in yellow we use aerial photography in areas where there's too many red trees to actually feasibly map with a helicopter or in areas where there's been a big change in the beetle population year after year after year. So we want to be able to map and track that, that change. And the last tactic we use is some of these areas up in here where we don't plan on doing many operations, but we want a fairly good idea of what the beetles are doing. We use fixed wing sketch mapping up there. So the detail isn't that specific, but at least we get an idea of what the beetles are doing. Here's an example of our Hella GPS, or pardon me, of our aerial photography. High resolution, 40 centimeter resolution, um, color photography that we do. Um, I don't know if you can see the colors here, but it does highlight these red trees fairly well. Um, our contractors and our consultants that use this technology are getting better and better and better at picking out those red trees. And not just picking out the red trees, but picking out the red pine trees. And they, as a product, they give us not only the images, but they give us a, a shape file of here's where the boundaries are, the numbers of infested trees in each one of those polygons. And so this is the third year we've done that, and our contractors are getting better, the quality is getting better, prices are coming down, and it's becoming more and more reasonable to use in an operational program. Plus, the photographs can be used for other purposes, layout, whatnot, other um, resource decisions that the government has to make. So, by the middle of September, uh, their FHOs and the aerial photographers, this is, they had mapped just over 15 million trees 
throughout this, this leading edge part of the province. It doesn't include these polygons that were done in the fixed wing sketch map. That is all the red trees are in this leading edge area where we're likely to be aggressive. So 1,500 or 15, 1 1.5 million trees were mapped. The last part of our risk assessment is understanding how well those local populations are doing and accounting for any inflights we might get into an area. And we do that using green to red ratios, which is simply the ratio of last year's attack to this year's attack at a specific site. So we do this in a very narrow time frame. We have two weeks to put these sites in because we, we want to get we want to get moving with our control program, but we have very little bit of time. So the Forest Health Officer spent a, in a two-week period, they blast the province to figure out, you know, what is the green-red ratios across the province. And these black dots represent where they take the sites. And the map here, anything in green shows the population is naturally declining year after year after year. There's less trees this year than there was at that site last year. The areas in red are the areas where we're seeing more infested trees than we saw the previous year. So again, this gives us an idea of how many currently infested trees are across the province. It drives our budgeting, it drives our operations, and it drives our risk assessment of where we have to put our efforts. We roll all that up, we model it. We model all those infested patches across the province to understand the risk of spread to the prime objectives. We send that back out to the forest health officers and say, you guys figure out how you're gonna control all those trees by March 31st of which all of our operations are done. They come up with their plans. We're gonna contact this area. Here's our timing. This is the areas we wanna do. This is how we're gonna do it. And our operations begin typically August, well, actually October, November, December is when we get going with our ground surveys and control work. So from November until March 31st, there was over 9,000 sites surveyed. The majority of that is done through contractors, although a few of our staff do a, a few of those sites, but the majority is done through contractors, and 96,000 trees, high-risk trees, that we deem high-risk trees were controlled. And just to show you where that occurs in the province, um, we'll start with the biggest, over 80% of our control program is in around this Grand Prairie. Um, 76,000 trees out of the 86 were done in that Grand Prairie region. And the reason we put so much effort in the Grand Prairie is, it is the conduit. It is a lot of susceptible pine trees and is a conduit for both the eastern spread as well as the southern spread. We've been putting a lot of effort in there over the last several years. And it's a, it's a very large, very complex program to run. The other areas you can see, Slave Lake and White Court, the numbers on the bottom here are the numbers we controlled last year. So the number of trees, we actually controlled more trees in Slave Lake and White Court. A lot of that probably has to do with those R values that show we had good local production last year. So we had to control more green trees down there. And then the good news story is down south, we're still having trouble finding beetles in southern Alberta. Um, three years ago, we treated over 32,000 trees down south, and now you know, we survey for them, but we don't find those beetle populations except for the Cypress Hills. Most of our work is done through a typical level one program, falling and burning, falling and chipping, mechanical treating those infested trees. But there's also some areas, particularly in Smoky, uh, in and around Grand Prairie, where there's some sites that are heavily infested, high risk, but there's no point in surveying these blocks because they're so heavily infested. So we get an idea of how many infested trees are in there, and we do a modified control, modified level one, and really our contractors go out there and they take out all the trees without spending the time to survey them first. So that's our operational program, but I want to follow up, I want to end this talk just by discussing some of the trends that we've seen over the long term in some of our key areas. And the key point here is without the in-flights in our leading edge zone where we're being most aggressive and we're putting most of our money, our numbers of beetle population of pheasant trees decreases year after year after year. I want to start with Hinton. I'm going to start in the Foothills Forest area, which is a good area to look at because um, it's always been our leading edge zone, so it's always been treated the same year after year after year. And up until this year, it's been surveyed by the same group of people, for the most part, over and over and over again. So it's very consistent. And we can map those red trees year after year after year just to get an idea of what the beetle populations are doing. Here's the trends. This is the bottom line of what I want to demonstrate. Here's the number of red trees that we have mapped year after year after year using our Hello GPS tactics. From 2004, 5, and 6, this is when the populations of British Columbia were on the increase. BC, their populations peaked in 2007. 
So in around Hinton, our populations increased. They were starting to go through this exponential growth, probably as a, as a result of these beetles coming in from BC, the spreading in for those populations spreading in from BC. In 2006, we know we had the first big inflight, and we tracked that mostly in Grand Prairie, but we also saw this inflight in the in the area in around Hinton, particularly north and around the Wilmore. So those trees would turn red in 2007, which is reflective on this graph. So we know it's a big spike in 2007 from the number of red trees that are out there as a result from that 2006 inflight. But 2008 and 2009, our numbers of red trees continued to drop. In 2009, we know we had a second inflight that was actually larger than the one in the 2006, and it spread more easterly into that area as well as over into White Court and over to Slave Lake. So we had another big pulse in 2010, which is a reflection of that 2009 inflight. And then 2011, 2012, our numbers continue to go down year after year after year. It's not just, this trend is not just uh, evident in foothills. We also see this in woodlands, although the numbers are a little tougher to, to demonstrate. In woodlands, when we first, we had very few beetles here up until four, five, and six. We had the first pulse in 2006, but we didn't have a massive inflight in that area, but they just got into that area. But again, seven, eight, and nine, our populations were dropping naturally. But the big inflighting around the white cord in the woodlands area was that 2009, which is reflected in 2010. We saw this huge spike in the number of beetles in 2010. But 11 and 12, as we surveyed, as we aggressively controlled these areas, our population trends continue to go down. But the last thing I want to mention is I was asked to do a presentation um, in Ottawa on the collaboration related to integrated pest management. And one of the first things we did was say, who are all the people that we've either worked with, gave money to, or have were impacted directly in interacting with the government related to mountain pine beetle over the last several years? And we came across quite an impressive list when we actually put all these people together to make this program work. Uh, a lot of municipalities, forest industry, Alberta government agencies, federal government agencies, um, research organizations, as well as our suppliers and our contractors. I was impressed with the amount of people and the co cooperation and the collaboration that exists in order to, to pull together a, a massive effort as what we're dealing with right now, dealing with Mountain Pine Bill.